Lawrence Hugo, welcome to Property Insights, mate. Good morning, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. So you're a director of credit mediation services. So let me know what credit mediation services does. Well, credit mediation service, uh, what we focus on is assisting businesses and consumers who are experiencing financial hardship. So we're not a budgeting specialist. Uh, we're not financial advisors or accountants. All we do as specialized negotiators is negotiate with their, their debt that is outstanding, ideally in arrears, and bring that debt down to a much more manageable level. So like, for example, um, are you talking about someone who might have a home loan or someone who's got a debt with Amex or you know, Westpac or credit card or Visa or something? What are we talking about? Or, right. just, or just a business, he might have a creditor, he might be a creditor of a business. Yeah. yeah. But what, what, uh, which one of those well, or all of them? The, all of the above and different kinds of services that we would provide. But the typical consumer client that we would experience would be um, Joe Lunchbox, who has 50,000 in credit cards, and would reduce that credit card down to perhaps you know, 10,000, and they pay that 10,000 out through the, the negotiations. With the commercial debt, it's somewhat different in profile. Their debts will be 100, 200, 300,000, or perhaps several million. And the idea is to reduce that payer figure once again like the consumer reduce it down to a much more lower figure that they can then manage through either a payment plan interest free or a settlement and typically it'll be around 10 20 30 cents in the dollar through the negotiations uh, well, that's pretty cool i like the idea of that uh, so uh, so when does somebody let's just let's just pick the example where you got someone's got credit card debt of 50 grand for argument's sake um, which sort of indicates to me they might have a few credit cards, not just one yeah. credit provider. And uh, at what point do they come and see you? Like, um, or not you, your firm. So how do they know to see you and when should they come and see you, by the way? Well, that's a really interesting question and it's different uh, at different stages. So someone might feel their pain points at the point where they're on, on the verge of bankruptcy and then they decide to seek outside assistance. Or it might be, oh, you know what, um, we're having trouble paying the food bill this month. And even though I'm paying on the button every single month with the mortgage repayments and the credit card repayments, suddenly I'm realizing, you know, I can't borrow any more money. I've reached my limit and, and you know, I can't pay the electricity bill. Or I can't pay the food bill and so on. And so they might seek assistance. Look, I'm, I've got a somewhat, I've got some debt, and they might have a good head about them, and they're they're seeing a retrenchment down the road, uh, or they're unemployed, and they feel like they've got to do something about their debts right now uh, before it gets out of out of control. So, if I'm if I got I don't know five credit cards at ten grand each, and they're at the max, they're limited, they're maxed out, and uh, and I'm struggling with the repayments. And maybe my wife's about to have another kid or I might have lost my second job or something along those lines. Mm. We get in contact with you guys. You know, me and my wife, for example, I can say we get in contact with you guys. What sort of happens? Like uh, I walk into your office or however you do the meeting. Um, what are you asking me for? What, am I, what have I got to give to you? What, what do you say? I might give us a look at all your income. Or how does it work? Right. Well, a good negotiator will first vet the client. What's the pain point? What's going on? Well, we know the pain point is that they're in arrears or they're struggling with their finances. But why are they struggling with their finances? So what caused it? Yeah. What's the trigger point? Is the trigger point, okay, well, I've lost my second job, as you mentioned. Um, is it the income or is it the expenditure? And so part of the role of a negotiator is to assess and audit their client to work out exactly what's going on. Because there's no point for a negotiator to then to go to the bank and ask for a 100% debt waiver or a 50% debt waiver or what have you. What the banks, they're not silly. What they're gonna do is they're, they're gonna want to see the income expenditure asset liability statement. And then they're gonna want you to evidence that with pay slips and statements and so on and so forth. Now you're gonna look pretty silly if you know, you've know you presented, you've asked for a 100% debt waiver, you've presented all the data and the bank says, well, hang on a second, your client doesn't have a financial hardship problem, they just got a budgeting problem. So the negotiator- Spend too will, much money. They spend too much money, like restaurants close and so on and so forth. So the negotiator will first go through an audit process to work out, well, what's the problem here? And what exit strategy is there? Because there's other things like, for example, if I've lost my full-time job, 
and all it takes is maybe a three months to locate a new job, the bank's response, and rightly so, will be, well, that's fine. We'll just put you on a three-month payment moratorium. That's under the NCCP. They're required to do that. Hardship. Yeah, under financial hardship. Exactly right. And that's perfectly reasonable because it's not a scenario, it's not an exit plan scenario where they've got to settle their debts. An exit plan scenario might look like I have cancer on one side to the other side where uh, I'm simply not earning enough. I'm working full time. I'm working part time on top of that. My wife's working and uh, and we're just not earning the the income to sustain our monthly payments with our credit cards. Yeah. So, but it, so when you do this audit, um, the client comes in. Um, they're they they you know they're struggling. They come in. You do the audit, and you see, for example, like they're spending a lot of money on Uber Eats and um, Uber, Uber Lifts, and uh, they've yeah. got a betting account and a uh, whole heap of things. Um, they're, they're pretty much living beyond their means and not making their payments to whoever it is that they owe the real money to, like a right. credit card provider or a bank or whatever, a mortgage holder. Um, what do you say to them? Do you say, well, can we refer you to a budgeting organisation? What, what do you do What do you do to that particular individual? Quite often, p- people spend emotionally, right? So we know money is a, a, a utility and there's nothing behind money, but it's what the emotions we put into it. And what we observe mark is emotional spending a lot on bank statements a lot of uh, what does that mean emotional spending emotional spending is is betting right like you buy a nice shirt now you're not buying the shirt for the utility purpose of covering your you know yourself you're buying a nice shirt because wow i'm going to look great makes you feel better it makes you feel better that's an emotional purchase and so people they make emotional decisions with their money now, when we look at a bank statement, now what we might see is is all this discretionary spending. But if you take away the discretionary spending, you see what their budget is. And if there's a surplus, they should go to a budgeting specialist. Right. They don't need a negotiator to do the job. They need a, a budgeting specialist or a financial counsellor. Um, however, if you take away all that you know, discre- discretionary spending and still they're in deficit, will help. Right. Whatever that, that spending is will still help because taking that away is not going to help them, right? So there's other, other, there's other things going on with them. So I'm amazed actually, but I mean, I'm, obviously this is the case because you said it, but you, you do the audit, you find out that they're genuinely underwater um, for whatever the reason is. Yeah. Could have lost a job, whatever the case may be. Just, just overborrowed. They're genuinely underwater, have no way of selling any, any assets to reduce the debt. So you take all this data, information, and you go along to the lender. Is there a department in the, let's say it's a credit card, is there a department in the bank that you know to deal with? I mean, is there somebody you guys can call up and say, listen, we've got this client. Because if, if I'm the borrower, if I'm the person with the credit card debt, I wouldn't know to call the bank anyway. I mean, these days you don't even have a bank manager. Yeah. So do you guys know who to talk to? Is there a department in the bank that you talk to? Yeah, there's certainly. So in the last 15 years, um, banks have established hardship departments to deal with financial counsellors, third party representatives and the general public. Now, these departments are specifically trained and geared towards assisting people who are experiencing financial hardship. Uh, so they'll go through these applications for financial hardship and they'll, they'll make a decision. Generally, the decision with the bank is, yes, we'll approve or not approve three-month payment moratoriums, You know, sometimes six months or a three by three. And so there are specific departments, but often it's the case where a negotiator is involved, they'll... As a matter of course, we'll liaise with that department, but then often we'll then bypass that department to go other, to other decision makers. Because what's been asked by the negotiator is usually out of the delegation of this hardship department. The hardship department will have a delegate, depending on bank by bank, um, and there are some banks that are much more mature in the hardship space than other banks, um, but, uh, but these departments, you know, they're, they're not able to, say, authorise a debt waiver or 10 or 20 or 30 cents in the dollar. It's not within their purview because it's not part of their purview. They don't have the authority. 
they don't have the authority. So you've got to have, you've got to escalate the matter to key decision makers within the bank who can look at that with a bit of world experience behind them and make a decision. So, you, so you, and so part of your inventory that people like you bring is um, you have access, or well, you know who these individuals are in, within the various institutions or most of the institutions, and you can, once you've exhausted the um, authority that, that the um, you know um, first order of people you talk to is exhausted, you're able then to elevate it to the next level. And then do you say, look, you know, mate, no, it's not probably not quite that terminology, but you say, look, the debt's too high. You, you've got to compromise the debt. You know, got to reduce it by, and you have an example before, but say by 50%. But if you reduce it by 50%, my client's in a position to be able to pay that off uh, so much per month over so many periods. Is that the reason why the lender, in this case, this example using the credit card provider, is that the reason why the credit card provider will actually accept your proposition? Because it's better to get to reduce the debt, to compromise the debt, and get at least half the debt, for example, I just gave you paid off over time, than to put the client, your client, in the position where they're going to get nothing. Is, it, is, it, is that, I mean, how do you negotiate that? Well, I mean, what, 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 why what it would incentivize the bank to say, yeah, yeah sure, we'll waive half yeah, the debt? Yeah. What, what's the deal? Like, what, what do you put in front of you? Because if you, if, are you saying, to them, if you don't do this, you're going to get nothing? Yeah, and that is the question. And the answer to it is not what you expect. You're talking to, and the, the biggest issue I have in doing my job is corporate banking indifference. So you talk to you talk to an individual in the bank and you say, all right, we want to do 30 cents in the dollar. What's going on in their mind? It's not, and if you evidence that that's all you can pay and they're going to lose all of it, 100 cents in the dollar unless they accept, that's not what's going on in their mind. What's going on in their mind is, how am I going to justify this if I'm audited internally? If they're audited. If they're the bank. audited, yeah. right. So I've got to justify this decision. And the policy and procedure said, duh, 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 no, I can't accept 30 cents the dollar with that vague profile. So they'll say no. They would rather, and I've had, I've had bank officers tell me, we would rather that your client apply for bankruptcy. We'll get nothing. And they'll apply for bankruptcy and that's it as opposed to accepting 30 cents a dollar or 10 or 50 or what have you. That happens because that means that the decision is taken off their desk and put onto someone else's desk, yeah. right? Because it's not their money. Yeah, That's yeah. the psychology behind it. It's not their money. They so work. what do you do in that circumstance? Oh, well, so you make them personally accountable, right? And there's nothing vicious or nasty yeah, about yeah. it, but rather, okay, Frank, you know, you've said you've said no to thirty cents of the dollar. Let's break down this case and look at it in great detail. Now, you have a financial responsibility to your employer, okay, to make the right financial decisions. I get why you're making this decision. It makes sense from your perspective, but let's look at it from another perspective. Shine another light on it, and you go through the case in great detail, and you can see that the bank is going to be out of pocket. Now that forces them because they're relying on policy procedure, but now. What you're highlighting to them is... You put them on notice or something. It's like putting them on notice. Now, short-circuiting this, because we don't like having those conversations and we try to make it as smooth and as friendly as possible because you deal with these people every day, right? And you want to have a, a professional relationship with them. So if I have a client who's, let's say it's a female in her 60s. In fact, we picked up a client a couple of weeks ago. She's at 63 and she's struggling financially. She's working part-time, just got a bit of credit card debt. Um, and she's single, right? And she's struggling with her rent. And so what is she going to do? Now, what I'll do, and she's got a, a, um, a two credit cards with a major, major bank. Now, I look at her and I think, okay, so I'm going to identify a decision maker within that bank who's in their 50s, female, in their 50s or 60s, and I'm going to go to that person in the bank and I'm going to present this client's case. Now, she is going to have a heightened level of empathy for our client. And, and so she will have a world experience behind her. She'll look at that and she'll make or more likely make a positive um, decision for us. Definitely empathetic anyway. Yeah, as opposed to, let's say, you get a 23-year-old straight from university. They're at storming stage of their career. 
and it's all about policy and procedure. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's really interesting. So h- how long does it take to build up these relationships such that you know who these individuals are? I mean, it's, you know, to cherry pick out of that example, to cherry pick out someone in the bank who's sort of equivalent to your client in terms of being able to empathize mm-hmm. with your client, equivalent in age perhaps, and maybe also, um, you know, gender. Um, how, how long does it take for organizations like yours to build these things up? Have you been doing this for a long time by the sound of things? Yeah, a long time. Yeah, I've been debt collecting for, well, I've been involved in debt collection, debt collection industry since the mid 80s. Wow. All right. 88, I think 87, 87. My first job was a debt collector with ANZ Bank. Right. So you know how the banks think. You've yeah. been in those env- environments. Can I ask you this? Have you seen a kick up in more, I mean, we're in tough times at the moment, interest rates are very high, relatively speaking. Um, a lot of people took on too much debt. We've got this fixed rate, so called mortgage cliff coming. People are now going from fixed to variable, which is in some cases three times the rate they were paying. Yeah. Are you seeing much kick up in um, inquiry? Huge. Really? Yeah, huge. Wow. Is it mortgage inquiry or um, non mortgage inquiry? Well, both. Like credit card inquiry? Both. Uh, the two that really stick out, Mark, is yes, suddenly the, the, the mortgage repayments are manifold which triggers ongoing issues. And people will pay their mortgage, no problems. They'll still struggle with their mortgage, but then everything else is sacrificed. So we get those inquiries. Uh, them, but we're also getting a huge amount of business debt inquiries. So uh, so what does that mean, like business owners? Business owners, SMEs, yep. who have... So this, is, this is this birth of um, uh, fintech lenders that have come out in the last few years who uh, lend business money, non-consumer, to small businesses, right? And there's a market for that, of yep. course. Um, but previously, where it's, say, ANZ or NAB, uh, who will have a business loan that's, say, you know, 80,000, 100,000 overdraft, they might be doing 150, 200, 250,000 unsecured. Right? These, these, new, these lenders. new lenders. And so we're getting a huge amount of inquiries with people who have... You know, we have a client from last month and he owes somewhere in the region of $600,000 well, unsecured. And his property is all caveated, caveated up because, you know, it's unsecured, but they've put caveats on the property and he can't pay them. You know, 15 grand a month, he can't pay them. It's just Because the, because the business environment's dropped off as a result of interest rate increases. I just flew back from Melbourne uh, and I was shocked. Last time I was there, it wasn't this bad, but... It, Every four or five shops shut for lease. You know, businesses are shutting down everywhere. So no. you're so you're seeing um, business borrowers increasingly seeking out your services to try and negotiate deals, mm-hmm. particularly with some of these um, newer banks. Um, what is the appetite of these newer newer institutions in terms of doing deals, settling the debt? I mean, is yeah. it not as experienced as the older banks? No, well, that's interesting because and they're it was not used like, to having debt um, pr- provisions they're, they're or write-offs. No, and it shows. So it reminded me of the early days dealing with the banks when we began negotiating back in two thousand three, two thousand four. Uh, banks didn't have hardship departments, and we we're dealing with the collection departments. In fact, that's how the hardship department started. They just yanked out a few collectors, retrained them, and created these hardship departments uh, and a reminder and they weren't used to they didn't have the vocabulary around hardship and they didn't they didn't have the mind frame around that back then now they do to a large degree so we're in the same place with these business lenders that and 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 they're not used to that they'll be willing to say okay well we're happy for the client to go bankrupt uh, and and so we'd have to start all over, all over again to try and navigate around that mind frame and get them re-geared towards agreeing to a settlement because that's a better outcome. Why is it a better outcome when oh, we've got it? We've got a case where a client has um, seven kids. Uh, he's got a fair amount of equity in his property, but he can't sell it because he's got all these kids um, and there's mental health issues. Now, we're trying to... <laughs> manage this so this client can keep the property but it means we've got to be getting around about 40 cents to the dollar with these business lenders All right they want him to sell and they might get 60 or 70 cents to the dollar so how do you turn them around so you're looking for these pressure points these key factors that's within their profile that you start pressing 
Now, it might take a, a tickle and a pinch for here and there, but you can get them over the line. And it, it's entirely possible to do that. It's just got to identify what their sensitive points are. So this, this works, do you find it, I mean, it'd be fairly stressful because <laughs> you're taking on the stress of your client because every client that comes to you is in stress um, by definition. Um, do you find it rewarding? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What, what, what's, what's, what is it about it? I mean, what, tell me about that. All right, so 30% of our business is pro bono, right? And that's mainly aged pensioners and cancer cases, terminal ill. Right, so when we have someone who's got, say, 12 months to live, they don't want to be thinking about debts. You've got 12 months, and your debts could mean you die in six months, or if you get rid of them, you might get another 18 months or 24 months, or who knows what after that. Um, so being able to take those credit cards and those personal loans and into a point in the mortgage and just make it disappear into the ether, it gives them time. It gives them peace of mind because you're going to worry if you've got a terminal illness, you're going to worry about your debts and how that's going to impact on your kids because they're going to inherit it in a sense through the estate because you know it'll be taken from the property and so on through the, um, that process. So the reward is being able to offer something like that to people, with whatever their circumstances are, whether they've got cancer or they don't, and we're just negotiating their debts, uh, to take that pressure off them is absolutely huge. Because as we talked about before, money is emotional. So by taking, on one side, they're spending the money for emotional reasons, but then on the other side, the burden, you've got the angel on the shoulder, you've got the devil on the shoulder, the other side is the burden, and that burden is manifold because of the money problems. And it ruins marriages, it stops you from sleeping, um, it affects your self-esteem, and people uh, sometimes will self-harm over the, um, the trauma of having so much debt. So taking all that, that trigger points away is enormously, uh, enormously rewarding. And, you know, people do this and they love it. So you, you said earlier that, um, you, and you, I sort of would expect this to be the case, that the interest rate environment that's, you know, been pushed hard by the RBA in order to control inflation in Australia um, has increased the amount of inquiry that you're getting. Um, but and you mentioned at a consumer level, but also at the business level, business borrowers and consumer borrowers. Mm. Um, but if you were to, and you've been through this a few times, you've been around since the '80s. So, where would you rank the level of intensity today, say compared to I don't know the mid '90s or early '90s when we had that oh. big inflation period? Um, are we sort of getting to those territories, or is it less intense or more oh, intense? Where, where would you it's put just it? Different apples and oranges. You know, uh, like in, in the 70s, it took you five years to save 20% for a deposit. And I think the home ownership rate was somewhere around between, depending on what numbers you look at, between 70 and 76% of households. So five years to save 20%, right? And today it's, again, if what numbers you look at, it's somewhere between 60 and 67% of households are are home uh, homeowners um, and it takes 10 years to save 20 percent deposit why is that it, i think the question um the question i'd ask myself and answering your question the question i'd ask myself is it's not why is it lower than the 70s compared to today but why is it so high your cost of living is so expensive and properties how do people afford to buy into the property market? I don't know. Well, especially today. I mean, especially today. Mental. But then, you know, thank goodness you had cheap money the last few years. And it's allowed families to come into the market, whereas previously they were completely locked out of it. Right. And so my view is the increase in the rates right now, I think we're coming back to normality. Which means? Which means we're getting normal again. You know, we have just these crazy low rates and now we're coming back to normality and we might drop again. And I'm no rate expert. I'm not an economist, just observationally speaking. Uh, my view is that, you know, it, we are coming back to normal times again. But in terms of inquiry to you guys, do mm -hmm. you find the intensity 
more now than it was in, say, in the 90s when we had this similar sort of inflation worry and interest rates going up really hard. I mean, in terms of inquiry to you guys, but people who are now being put under so much pressure, are we under more pressure today than we were, say, in the 90s or nowhere near it? Again, different. Because in the 90s, I was on the other side debt collecting, yep. foreclosing on mortgages. Right? Back then, uh, your requirement is to foreclose. Today, if you're facing a foreclosure, you have a lot more leeway with the banks. The banks have learned a lot. Um, thank God. Yeah, thank goodness. So, so no, gone are the days when you're 90 days in arrears and they begin the foreclosure process, right? Um, there's hardship provisions and there's benefit of the doubt. Uh, the other day I was talking, I was shocked. I was talking to a client. It's a good thing. So this bank allowed her to be, what, five, six years in arrears. And they've just worked with her because she's had ongoing chronic illness and they just worked with her time and time. And that's great. It's fantastic. So banks, and that's not typical though, but banks give a lot more leeway compared to the 90s and the 80s. Back then, it's more, you know, it is, boom, we're foreclosing. See you later. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like, there's a ton of properties in mining towns that, uh, that one particular bank is very shy to foreclose on because... You know, the, the was worth a million dollars. Now it's worth two hundred thousand, and the mortgage is five hundred thousand, for example. It's and the bank lent it to him. And the bank lent it to him in the first place. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And knowing and, the risks. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, and I guess also one of the reasons why it's different today is because there's a lot more people around like you today on the other side of the table. In back in the nineties, there was not very many people on the side of the table of the consumer. Right. Everybody was on the side of the table of the lender, the banks. And as you you guys have developed a whole industry around this yeah. and that is looking after consumers and you know lenders have as a result of legislation have had to become much more conscious of borrowers and not just foreclose and yeah. had to give them hardship relief and work with people which yeah. by the way they should do yeah. it makes sense to me uh lawrence hugo i really appreciate um uh, this discussion it's not the discussion we normally have but it's quite timely i think i think it's timely given what's going on in australia at the moment and um and i appreciate the examples you gave me because I think some people may be listening and they might be getting close to needing someone's help. So I would say to them, I would suggest to anybody, if you feel as though you're getting into trouble, then go and see someone like Lawrence. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me on.